Good evening. Anna Gremling here of the Indianapolis Metropolitan Planning Organization. Welcome to today's uh, IMPO speaker series on safety. Uh, for those of you who don't know, the Indianapolis Metropolitan Planning Organization is probably that organization that you've never heard of. That's okay. Um, we are founded and based in transportation planning. Essentially, every time you fill up on, uh, at the gas pump, you pay a federal gas tax. We get a portion of that funding back to the tune of about $60 million to fund infrastructure projects and planning projects around the region. When I talk about the region, I'm talking as far north as Cicero, as far south as Franklin, and from Danville to Greenfield. So we do cover a pretty good swath of central Indiana. Not only were we founded in transportation planning, but we are now branching out into other areas that have regional geographic um, impacts, such as housing, land use, economic development, and resiliency, um, and some environmental planning as well. I'm super excited to talk about safety today and for today's speaker. But before that, I'm going to kick it over to Andrea Miller, who is uh, the IMPO's project manager on, on several safety projects, and you're going to hear from her. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anna. I am so excited to be here with you all tonight. Um, this event serves as a continuation of the work in safety that the IMPO has been doing in the past years, um, an item that's been of increasing focus more, more recently. Items such as the crash dashboard have provided data on crashes both to our members as well as the public since 2018. And more recently, in 2022, the IMPO completed the Safe Streets and Roads for All Safety Action Plan, which provides safety information and recommendations intended to help us achieve our region's Vision Zero goal of reducing serious and fatal crashes. Tonight's event builds on this work. It serves to enhance general awareness about this issue, and most importantly, we come here today to learn more about what can be done to reverse the trend in serious and fatal crashes. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our main speaker for the night. Jesse Singer is a journalist and author of There no Are No Accidents, The Deadly Rise of Injury and Disaster, Who Profits and Who Pays the Price, a slate, Fortune Magazine, Mother Jones, and The Economist's Best Book of the Year. She is an expert in safe systems, injury prevention, harm reduction, and the ongoing rise in traffic fatalities, drug overdoses, falls, and other areas of injury-related death. Jesse's writing appears in the Washington Post, The Atlantic, The Nation, Bloomberg, New York Magazine, The Guardian, and elsewhere. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Jesse. Hello. I have three words for you. What happens next? These are the three most important words you should remember after a fatal or injurious crash in your community. Typically, we don't do this. Instead, we tend to focus on what happened first. We learn of a traffic crash, and then we seek the person who made a mistake. And I'm here to tell you that this is the wrong place to focus your energy. And here's why. If you look at what happened before a traffic crash, I guarantee that you will find someone who made a mistake. And the problem is, once you've found that mistake, you're going to think that you found the root cause of this traffic crash. But you'll be wrong, because the conditions that allow that mistake to become a disaster will remain. So today, we're not going to talk about the errors that may precede a traffic crash, except to say that we spend far too much time focused on those errors. We're instead going to talk about what we do after things go wrong. We're going to talk about what happens next. Because in my research, I've uncovered that the most important thing we can do to prevent injuries on our roads in a long-term and systemic way hinges on what we do and how we think right after things go wrong. So in doing so, we can find common ground for learning between seemingly different traffic crashes. We can overcome the crutch of blaming human error and the idea that human behavior is something that we can control. And we can learn how systemic changes to our built environment can reduce the harm of traffic crashes, 
24 hours a day, even when someone makes an error or a bad decision on the road. And I'm going to cover all that today, but I'm getting ahead of myself. So to start, let me explain how I came to be standing before you all today. I found all this out the hard way. Um, unlike many of the people in this room, I'm not a traffic engineer or a government official. I'm an investigative journalist and an author. But I'm also a person who suffered a horrible loss. And that loss was called an accident. On the screen is a photo of uh, me and my best friend a year before his death. His name was Eric Ng. He was kind and funny and deeply righteous. He taught math at a New York City high school. And he was just 22 years old when he was struck and killed by a driver while riding his bicycle. In 2006, Eric was riding his bike on the Hudson River Greenway, which is a separated biking path that runs along the west side of Manhattan in New York City, where we both lived. He was riding uptown on this bike path when he was struck and killed by a man driving downtown. The driver had mistakenly turned and entered the path and then driven for more than a mile. The driver was also drunk and speeding 60 miles an hour. Eric died on the sidewalk of massive internal injury. The driver who killed my best friend had made obvious errors. He was drunk, he was speeding, he was driving a car on a bicycle path. And for these reasons, he was sent to prison. And for a long time, that appeared to be the end of the story. A drunk driver, an accidental turn, a prison sentence. The end. And so for a long time, while I mourned, I didn't ask further questions. Um, but 11 years later, something would happen that would inspire a thousand questions. It would become the reason I've devoted my life to investigating human error, adverse events, and the so-called accidents that kill hundreds of thousands of Americans every year, in hopes of preventing what happened to my best friend from ever happening again. 11 years after my best friend was killed by a man driving back town on that bike path, a different man rented a truck and followed the exact same route. Except unlike the man who killed my best friend, this man was sober and intentionally turned onto the bike path. On October 31st, 2017, he drove downtown on that bike path, killing eight people and severely injuring 11 in an act of vehicular terrorism. I remember getting the call that morning and being truly shocked that someone had killed so many people in the exact same place, in the exact same way as Eric had been killed. Of course, though, there were a few ways you could look at what happened. Was it history repeating, or was I seeking coincidence where none existed? In one light, the incident was nothing like Eric's death. Different perpetrators, different intentions, different crimes. But in another light, the incident was identical. Same point of entry, same weapon, same location, same mechanism of harm, same cause of injury-related death. The question of whether history was repeating, or I was seeking coincidence where none existed, could be answered by how you saw the problem. Did all these people die because of decisions that drivers made, or because the environment allowed those decisions to cause harm? Did, if you saw the problem as the former, right, a matter of decisions, then the deaths were totally unrelated. But if you saw the problem as the latter, a matter of conditions, then the deaths were inextricable. So to find out the answer, I started asking questions about my best friend's death, and in particular, the place where he died. And what I found out was that long before the terror attack, other people had been killed on the same bike path, just the same way, before and after Eric had been killed. Now, every time the drivers were different. Some were drunk, some were distracted, some were just lost. And they all made different mistakes and bad decisions that led them to end up on the path. But they all ended up on this bike path, and they all killed someone with their cars. And every time the same story was told. It was an accident. A person made a mistake. Someone died, and what happened next? Every time, city officials sought out what happened first, and they found an individual error. After the individual was corrected, each incident was considered solved. But after the terror attack, after this intentional act, the story was different. It was no longer a so-called accident because there was no question about who had done something wrong. Now, someone was still punished, of course, but after the terror attack, something else happened too. For the first time, the city questioned the dangerous conditions built into the design of the bike path. The truth was that the bike path looked identical to the adjacent road. It had a double yellow line running down it like every road in America. Every entrance was big enough for a car. So after the terror attack, the city changed those conditions. No longer would the bike path look identical to the adjacent road. Now every single entrance to the path would be barricaded. You could still bike onto the path, 
but you could no longer fit a car through the bollards. Just like that, they made the harm impossible. They paid attention to what could happen next, and they prevented both the terror attack and the so-called accident from ever happening again. For me, it was a stark realization that we individualize problems as a form of magical thinking. Focusing on human error allows us to disregard preventable harm because it's cheaper and easier and more satisfying to decide that someone made a mistake than to decide that you need to redesign a whole bike path or a whole highway or a whole city's traffic management plan. And it all rests on whether you're paying attention to what happened first or what happens next. This is at the core of solving traffic safety problems in our communities, what we do and how we think about what happens next. Consider my story. For decades, people died on the bike path where my best friend was killed because the safety professionals in charge of the engineering and design and management of the street saw each incident as a unique individual product of human error. Focusing on human error in Eric's death and in all the deaths that would come before and after is a way that professionals were seeing injury as a so-called accident and thinking about what happened first. Every time they asked, who made a mistake? And then they corrected for that person's mistakes, leaving the dangerous system in place. When we focus on what happened first, we leave in place the through line that connects all the bike path deaths or all the deaths on any given street. We conclude that a human made an error and we ask, how can we make a less error-prone human? Think about it, questions of error almost always follow a traffic crash. We ask, was she looking at her phone? Was he speeding? Who wasn't paying attention? Inherent in these questions is a presumption that traffic crashes are caused by error-prone people or people making bad decisions or people we think did things the wrong way. Now, this is not untrue. People make mistakes. Human error is a part of many fatal and injurious crashes. The question though, the most important question, is whether or not these errors and mistakes are actually significant to the prevention of harm. And I say no, not really, and certainly not to the degree of emphasis that we place on them. Because mistakes and errors only become consequential under certain circumstances. People make mistakes while driving and biking and walking all the time and no one dies. Not every screw up ends in injury. So to better understand traffic crashes, we need to retrain our focus in a more productive way. We need to truly understand the difference between these two ideas, errors and conditions. A human error is a mistake and a dangerous condition is an environment. For example, to slip is a human error. Water left on the floor is a dangerous condition. To exceed the speed limit is a human error. A wide, straight road designed for speed, that's a dangerous condition. To jaywalk is a human error. A bus stop without a crosswalk is a dangerous condition. What I'm talking about is the difference between the way people behave and how the conditions surrounding their behavior affects what happens next. Now, let's stick with the wet floor example. You can slip anywhere, right? With or without water on the floor. But in the dangerous environment of a wet floor, you're gonna fall harder and faster, you're less likely to be able to catch yourself, and you're more likely to get hurt. Same is true of the wide open road or the bus stop without a crosswalk. A driver can speed on any street, but on a wide straight road, they're gonna go faster, and they're less likely to be able to stop in time. Jaywalking can happen anywhere, but at a bus stop without a crosswalk, it's far more likely, and far more likely to get you killed. Simply put, Conditions induce behaviors, and it is harder to control the harm of our mistakes in the face of dangerous conditions. And what matters is the harm. That's what we're here to change. Here's a definition. We should understand a traffic crash as what happens when human error occurs under dangerous conditions. You can make mistakes anywhere, but mistakes become tragedies and disasters when they occur under conditions that are high risk. And as much as we like to pretend differently, it is all but impossible to prevent error. But conditions, those are in control of many of the people in this room. The truth is that human behavior, the thing we're most focused on after an injury or death, is hard to control and impossible to perfect. But dangerous conditions are in our control. But we rarely focus on them, right? We instead spend loans of energy focused on error, using education and penalization to correct behaviors that people naturally tend towards, while disregarding the social and built environments to which people are exposed and which often influence their behavior. 
And this tendency is so pervasive, you might not even notice it. For example, if a floor is wet, we put out a sign that says wet floor instead of drying it. If speeding is a problem on a local road, you're more likely to see police officers patrolling than a redesign of the road that makes it more difficult to speed. If someone is killed jaywalking to a bus stop, we may test their corpse for drugs and alcohol before we consider that we need to install a crosswalk everywhere that there is a bus stop because people need to cross the street where the bus stops. We focus on error, we don't change conditions, and then we act surprised that people are imperfect. But the truth is that we are all deeply imperfect. In a bit, I'm gonna talk about how we do this, how after a traffic crash, we can shift what happens next and why this is in our control and in the control of many of the people in this room rather than individual users of the road. But first, because the crutch of human error is not a small one, I wanna talk about why we do what we do. Why, when it comes to the question of what happens next, we so often choose to find a person who we think needs fixing and how this is the source of safety failures. All right, so we focus on error because it's cheaper and easier, because it doesn't require upsetting the status quo. You know, if we decide that traffic crashes are people problems, then we get to think of each one as an aberration and the system as perfectly sound. And then we don't need to question or challenge powerful people who decided that the status quo should be as it is. And we're gonna get back to both those ideas later, but I first wanna talk about the third reason that we focus on error when things go wrong, which is that we are psychologically primed to do so. Psychologists call our tendency to focus on who did what wrong, especially about other people's injuries and other people's mistakes, the fundamental attribution error. Now, this is a key concept. The fundamental attribution error is the near universal tendency to see your own mistakes as the product of the environment you were in at the time and to see other people's mistakes as a problem of human error and personal responsibility. It's called the fundamental attribution error because we get it wrong fundamentally, even in the face of all evidence to the contrary. When we screw up, we blame the conditions that we were suffering under. But when other people screw up, we blame their decisions and who they are as people. Um, now, this process obviously does not help solve problems. Um, rather, we do this to make ourselves feel better, to separate ourselves from disaster and tragedy. When we ask, what did person X do wrong, and we produce an answer, we're able to draw a line in the sand between ourselves and terrible outcomes. This process of deciding who did what, who did what wrong, it's a way of telling a bad person's story. And this is another key concept known as the just world fallacy. It is the simple and very false belief that the world is just, that good things happen to good people and bad things happen to bad people. It's a way of reasoning backwards. We look at an error or an injury or a traffic crash and we think, I bet they did something to deserve this. And this is super comforting because if you can decide that the injury was caused by person X doing something wrong, and thus that person X is bad, then you've decided that you're not that, that you're good, that you would make better decisions under the same circumstances. It's all an elaborate way of saying, couldn't happen to me. And this is why that phrase, what happens next, matters so much, and it matters so much more than what happened first. If a person is struck while jaywalking to a bus stop where there's no crosswalk, and what happens next is that the government official in charge of that street, to comfort themselves, decides that what happened first was that a bad person jaywalked, then the bus stop without a crosswalk remains. Focusing on what happened first, identifying that human error is at best an inconsequential and largely ineffective answer to the problem. At worst, it actually sets the stage for the same traffic crashes to happen again and again. I think it's important to acknowledge this tendency is understandable. There are pressure to preserve reputations. Identifying a low level bad guy helps us all save face. Finding human error can even feel like a win because if what happened first was a human error, then the traffic crash is not a systemic problem. It's just a local glitch in an otherwise smooth operation. This is why formal traffic crash investigations often start with what happened first and the assumption that someone failed. Starting anywhere else, such as the assumption that the policies and built environment that preceded the error were unsafe, that challenges the status quo, and that is not a small task. Now, in a little while, I'm gonna to talk to you about how you can challenge that status quo. 
if you're ready. But first, I want to talk about some of the things I hear from people who are not yet ready to challenge the status quo. When I travel around the country, I like to ask people what they think is the cause of traffic crashes. There's a good reason to be asking these questions. After decades of decline, traffic fatalities and injuries, and especially pedestrian and cyclist fatalities, have been rising in the US for about 10 years. Every year, we break another terrible record. And so I ask everyone this, experts, strangers, people in line at the grocery store. Why is driving and biking and walking so dangerous? What is causing all these traffic deaths? And almost always, I get three answers. Smartphones, COVID, and bike helmets, or a lack thereof. Sometimes speeding drivers and drunk drivers get thrown in there. And I'm here to tell you that none of these answers is right. These are what we call, what I call, human error red herrings. They are distracting, misleading human error explanations for the rise in traffic fatalities. And uh, I'm going to break down why. First, let's talk about smartphones. I hear this one all the time. We are getting into more traffic crashes because we are distracted by our phones. Now, it is true that our phones are terribly distracting. But this is not an explanation for the rise in traffic fatalities. Perhaps the simplest proof of this can be found in Finland. Um, so between 2012 and 2021, traffic fatalities fell by 26% in Finland. In that same period, traffic fatalities in the US rose by 29%. And not only do they have as many smartphones per capita in Finland, 49% of Finnish drivers self-report using their phones while driving. In fact, on average, Finnish drivers use their phones while driving more than other Europeans. And Finland has some of the lowest traffic fatality rates in Europe. The truth is that smartphones are everywhere and equally distracting everywhere. So if not the smartphone, then what's the difference between Finland and the US? Why are traffic fatalities falling there and rising here? The difference is the conditions under which people drive, often while looking at their smartphone. Finland designs its roads to reduce the harm and likelihood of crashes. For example, Finland reduces speed limits and narrows roads so drivers feel less safe speeding. The average lane width in Finland is around two feet narrower than the US. So when you leave here today and get in your car, if you drove, try to imagine your lane was two feet less wide. Imagine how that would make you drive. What this means is that the consequences of using your phone while driving are less severe in Finland. You are less likely to be distracted because the narrow road forces your attention to the road. And if you are distracted, the consequences occur at a slower, safer speed because you're driving slower, because it feels a lot less safe to drive fast. Okay, next on the list of traffic safety red herrings, COVID. I hear this one a lot too, more lately. Uh, COVID-19 broke down the social fabric and now everyone drives like a maniac. People tell me this. Um, now this one's pretty easy to debunk. Um, COVID changed a lot of things, but even if the social fabric were something we could quantify, this would also not explain the rise in traffic fatalities. Let's look at Germany and France for this. Now, these two nations suffered Europe's greatest casualties from COVID-19. However, while traffic fatalities rose every year of the pandemic in the US, traffic fatalities in both France and Germany are lower today than they were in 2019. This is because Germany and France are actively reducing speed limits on major roads, using road design to moderate speed and limiting car access to dense cities. So the US saw an uptick in traffic fatalities in 2020, while other countries saw declines, uh, not because we were uniquely unhinged during the pandemic, but that US roads are designed for speed. And in the lockdown era absence of congestion, those designed for speed roads were especially empty and wide open. Also notably, US traffic fatalities have been rising for about 10 years now, so long before COVID hit. So it's not COVID-19. Uh, all right, next human error, red herring, specific, but maybe close to the heart of some people in this audience, bike helmets. Um, if you're paying attention, you'll notice that the presence or lack of a bike helmet is always the first thing mentioned when a cyclist is killed. Uh, when Eric was killed, uh, the New York Times noted that he wasn't wearing a helmet. He was hit by a 4,000 pound car driving 60 miles an hour head on. It was a crash that was not survivable, helmet or not. Now, don't get me wrong, bike helmets are good for protecting you from a low speed impact with the asphalt. I always wear one. But they're also a red herring. Here's why. 
For one, even the manufacturers of bicycle helmets will tell you that their product is not meant to protect you from impact with a car. And of course, the vast majority of cyclist deaths involve an impact with a car. But an even more compelling way to debunk the idea that a lack of helmet wearing is to blame for the rise in cyclist deaths is this. The countries with the lowest rates of helmet use also have the lowest rates of cyclist fatalities. And the US, which has the highest rate of helmet use, has the highest rate of cyclist fatalities. What this tells us is that biking conditions are different in those countries where cyclists are wearing fewer helmets. People are more separated from the dangerous energy of cars. They're better protected. And so this little piece of styrofoam on the head really doesn't make the difference. Okay, so smartphones, COVID-19, bike helmets, these are these human error red herrings. They're all distracting ways to focus our attention on people's decisions instead of the conditions that people face. All these explanations are just shorthand for human error. They're just other ways to say someone did something wrong. This crash was caused by a bad person. The system's fine if it just wasn't for that one bad person. Rather, the explanation for traffic fatalities and its current rise is the different conditions that we all face on the roads. Like this image of US 19 in Florida, the most dangerous road in America for pedestrians. Imagine trying to cross that street. Imagine needing to cross that street. The conditions on US 19 are not safe for pedestrians, for cyclists, or for drivers. And the conditions are certainly not safe for anyone to make an error. This is a high consequence street, a street where you have to be perfect if you're gonna survive. So we can believe that Americans are uniquely prone to error, and that's why traffic fatalities are rising here while they're falling everywhere else. Or we can accept that the conditions on American roads are unique. And I have to say, even if you don't believe anything I'm telling you, the latter is still a better, more logical choice, and not only because our crash rates and the design of our roads prove it to be true. Understanding the unique U.S. rise in traffic fatalities through the conditions on American roads is a better choice because it is a solvable problem. You can't change who we are. Not really. You're not going to change human nature. But you can change the conditions that we face. If you still don't believe me, if you still think that fatal traffic crashes are caused by bad drivers, I'd ask you this. Are people from Indiana worse drivers than people from Ohio or Illinois? Because if you think traffic crashes are caused by bad drivers, then people from Indiana must be worse drivers than people from Ohio and Illinois. And all of those Midwesterners must be way worse drivers than people from my hometown in New York City. Do we think that's true? Because you are more likely to die in a traffic crash in Indiana than you are in Ohio or Illinois and you're way more likely to die in all of those places than in New York City. So if traffic crashes are caused by bad drivers, people here must be worse to drivers. As soon as you cross the state line, they must become a better driver. This is, of course, not true. This state is not full of worse drivers than the neighboring states. What is different is the conditions faced by drivers in each place. So this gets at another traffic safety red herring, speeding drivers. And it's a prime way to understand this idea. Now, speed kills. This is undeniable physics. But the red herring is that the problem is speeding drivers and not the unmanaged design speed of the road. The problem is not speeding drivers, but speed itself. Which is to say, this is not a people problem. It's a problem of conditions. Let me give you an example to explain. Far more people are killed in traffic in the US than Europe, and speed is a major factor but speeding drivers are not the major factor. Here's the truth. In surveys, 40 to 50% of Americans admit to exceeding the speed limit. And around 40 to 50% of Europeans admit to exceeding the speed limit. So what's the difference? Why are we dying at a higher rate if everyone has the same amount of speeders? It's because the problem is speed, not speeders. Speed limits are lower elsewhere and roads are designed to encourage high-speed driving. They're designed to focus your attention. Where US roads, and especially roads like US 19, through dense, congested, high traffic places, have higher speed limits and road designs that encourage high speed driving. It's not the speeding that matters as much as the speed. And this is actually really good news 
because the engineers and the government officials among you are probably overwhelmed by the process of endlessly catching and stopping individual speeders again and again. I'm telling you, you can start to relax and instead focus that money and energy on managing the speed of your roads. What I'm talking about may seem like a difference of degrees or semantics, but it is at the core of the conversation about how we approach the problem of speeding. If we see speeding as a problem of bad people, a problem of what happened first, a problem of speeders, then the solution is to punish individual bad people after they speed, which I'm sure is something that seems like an endless battle in all your communities. Let me give you a better way to look at it. What if we see speeding not as a problem of human error, but of conditions? Not as a problem of bad people, but of circumstances that induce bad behavior. If we do that, we can control what happens next. We can stop speeding before it starts. Here's how. There's a wealth of research that shows that drivers in the top image are going to drive faster than drivers in the road in the bottom image. There will always be more speeding on that top road. Why? Because the driver, with all that space around their car, feels safe driving fast. And this is true even if both roads would likely have the same speed limit. Regardless of the speed limit, people would drive faster on the upper road. Now, this is a small residential street, but the same is true on big commercial streets. Here's a different set of roads with the same idea. The top road is all but guaranteed to have more speed-related crashes. Now, let's talk about what happens next. Typically, if there were a spate of speed-related crashes on the upper road, we would say that the problem is people speeding. And if the problem is people speeding, then the tools in our toolbox are after-the-fact enforcement and what I think of as, frankly, pie-in-the-sky public service announcements. So you could give tickets for speeding, but you won't catch everyone, of course, and you certainly won't catch everyone every time they speed. And one thing we know for sure about punishment is that the certainty of getting caught matters far more than the degree of punishment. You could also put up a billboard that says speeding kills, but even the US DOT says that sort of thing doesn't work. Um, and if you don't believe me, I challenge you to recall two billboards you saw on your drive here. Um, now, don't get me wrong, these tools have their uses, but if we're talking about education enforcement to stop drivers from speeding on that top road, we're doing the equivalent of leaving a child alone in a room full of candy, telling them not to eat any. We're covering a floor in oil and telling people not to slip. So based on what we've talked about today, I would like you to try to see these two photos in another way. I would like you to look at these two photos and their differential crash rates and see how the problem is not speeders, but speed. Because then we can design the streets in a way that induces slow driving. Will some people still speed? Yes, of course. Will the fatal crash rate plummet and will you save lives? Absolutely. We can design streets that are self-enforcing and self-educational. That's what's happening in the bottom photo. The very design of the street tells drivers to slow down and makes them feel unsafe if they don't. In a minute, I'm going to show you some real life examples of how to create self-enforcing and self-educational streets. Um, but I want to talk about drunk driving and a better way to see even that egregious human error. Um, OK. This is the last on my uh, commonly cited causes of traffic fatalities and perhaps the most difficult to discuss, drunk driving. I say this as someone whose best friend was killed by a drunk driver. Even fatal drunk driving crashes can be a matter of conditions. Uh, to explain, I want to turn to the epidemiologist, Dr. Susan Baker. Dr. Baker invented the injury severity score, the ER triage still uses today. She popularized the child car seat. And when I asked her to sum up her collected knowledge of her career, she gave me her somewhat controversial safety ethos. To make the road safe, she said, make the road safe for drunks. The bottom line is if you make this world safe for drunks, you make it safe for everybody. By focusing on making the world safe for the average reasonably smart sober person, then the drunks, the sleepy heads, the guy who's worried about getting home for his child's operation, it's not going to be safe for them. We have a choice. We can make streets safe for everyone. Drunks, sleepy people, people who make mistakes. Or we can leave those streets safe for no one but the perfect driver. Either we design for the lowest common denominator, or we design for the perfectly attentive, perfectly trained, perfectly present, perfectly behaved driver. And I don't know about you, but I'm not sure that driver exists. The truth is that even if you or I never exceed the speed limit or drive drunk, one day we'll make a mistake. One day we will be tired, we will be distracted. And that is why our goal should be to reduce the impact and likelihood of our mistakes. So what is to be done? How do we stop blaming all these traffic safety red herrings and start to challenge the status quo? I want to share with you a few different versions of what this looks like, because what I'm talking about is not fantastical. It's practical and helping elsewhere in the country and around the world. When we set aside our urge to diagnose human error and instead challenge the conditions that people face on our roads, we are choosing a systemic preemptive approach instead of an individual reactive one. And we do this on a small scale, 
on a single dangerous street or on a large scale across a whole city or a country. Okay, first up, changing the status quo on the smallest scale, one street. This is Prospect Park West, a street in Brooklyn, New York, where I'm from. In 2009, it looked like the image on the left. Um, it was, in 2009, it uh, looked like the image on the right. Um, it was adjacent to the borough's biggest park, and it was known for crashes and two human error problems. Cyclists riding on the sidewalk and drivers speeding. Three out of the four drivers on the street exceeded the speed limit. Around half of cyclists rode on the sidewalk. Let's imagine a traffic crash in the street on that uh, right-handed image and construct two different causes. Now, if you took a what happened first approach, a human error approach, you might say that a crash on this street was caused by a driver speeding or a cyclist riding on the sidewalk. Your solution then might be signage or enforcement against other people who might make the same error. But if you took a what happens next approach, if you question the conditions that drivers and cyclists faced on the road and why they might be making those decisions, then you might say that a crash on the street was caused by the way that the design of the road induced speeding or the, the way that a lack of space for cycling on the road induced riding on the sidewalk. Your solution then might be to redesign the road with narrower lanes to make drivers feel less safe speeding and use that excess space for a protected bike lane. Now, this is a real street, so I can tell you what happened. Uh, for years, the city of New York took a what happened first approach, targeting speeding and sidewalk cycling with summonses and signage. The problems remained, as did high crash rates. Then in 2010, the city of New York narrowed the street and installed a protected bike lane. That's the image on the right. Um, almost immediately, speeding fell from 75% of drivers to just 20%. Cycling on the sidewalk fell from 46% of cyclists riding on the sidewalk to just 3%. The number of cyclists using the route tripled. Traffic efficiency stayed the same, commuter volumes increased, injurious crashes fell 63%. When the city of New York finally stopped focusing on what happened first, and instead paid attention to what ha would happen next by changing the conditions of the street, most of the human error evaporated into thin air. The city made speeding feel unsafe by reducing space for drivers and made cycling on the street feel safer with dedicated space for cycling. The truth is that drivers traveling on the street in that first image were doing so because it felt safe to go fast, and cyclists rode on the sidewalk because it felt safe there and not elsewhere. What happened here changed human error into compliance preemptively before the worst occurred and holistically for every road user before they had a chance to make an error. Next, I'd like to share an example of what changing the status quo looks like on a larger scale. In Hoboken, New Jersey, just across the river from New York City, there are citywide traffic safety efforts going on that have led Hoboken to become the first US city to achieve Vision Zero. Now, Hoboken has changed roads citywide, not just at crash hotspots, but potential future crash hotspots. And in a way that focuses not on preventing human error, but reducing the harm and likelihood of mistakes. As a result, from 2019 through 2020, while traffic crashes were rising across the US, Hoboken saw a 35% drop in pedestrians struck by drivers and a 27% drop in traffic crashes. That's in a single year. No one has been killed in traffic in the city in four years and counting. One way they've done this is daylighting. So daylighting involves removing the parking spaces closest to a crosswalk, opening up visibility for drivers and pedestrians. Daylighting reduces the likelihood of an error, like I didn't see them. But Hoboken did not just implement daylighting at intersections where crashes had occurred. They daylighted almost every intersection in the city. And related to that, another notable step that Hoboken took was to systematize the road redesign process into everyday repaving and pothole filling. Whenever a street was due for repaving, the street's crash rate was considered. And with the repaving came wider sidewalks, new medians, raised crosswalks, bus lanes, and bike lanes. This is a way to make safe streets part of the bread and butter work-a-day business of government. 
What is happening in Hoboken is how the status quo changes. The status quo changes when we do more than fix the street we know is broken because someone died there. The status quo changes when we preempt, when we anticipate danger before the worst occurs, when we systematize safety into something as status quo as repaving the street. And that sort of system-wide change does not come without leadership. So I have one last story to tell you about that. And it's about how brave leadership can bring system-wide change that prevents traffic crashes and saves lives. But um, I have a disclaimer for this story, which is um, this story takes place in Sweden. So before you roll your eyes, I know that Indianapolis is not Sweden. Not even close, not even a little close. But I also know that you're in this room because you want to learn how to prevent traffic crashes and save lives. And that means you're a brave leader. And that means you're ready to challenge the status quo. And that means that I think you might find something helpful in what a leader in Sweden learned. So this story isn't about streets, not really. It's a story about brave leadership and challenging the status quo. So this story starts in Sweden in the 1990s. I want to tell you about the day when a traffic safety specialist named Klaus Tingvall sat down for a routine meeting with the Swedish Minister of Transportation. The transportation minister asked Klaus what at the time was a routine yearly question among safety specialists. Perhaps it's a question you've asked in your offices as well. The transportation minister asked, what kind of target should we set for how few people are killed in traffic? And Klaus did something that as a safety specialist he wasn't supposed to do. He said no one should be killed or injured in traffic crashes. Nothing should be more important than that, he said, no matter what it costs. And the room fell silent because what Klaus proposed was an elemental shift. Now, this was not a public meeting. Klaus was not political posturing. He was truly proposing, practically, that the government of Sweden put safety above all else. And remarkably, that day, the transportation minister agreed. So in Sweden, the old way to design roads was to balance safety, efficiency, and cost. It was important that no one die, but it was equally important that no one was late to work and that none of it cost too much. I imagine this is still the expectation in Indianapolis. It certainly is in New York City where I'm from. In fact, it is the expectation in most systems that we call safe that safety is not paramount, but balanced with efficiency and cost. We like to pretend that having multiple priorities isn't an oxymoron. Sweden gave up that illusion. What Klaus Tingvall and the Swedish transportation minister began that day would come to be called Vision Zero, the safe systems approach to road safety. They threw out the old desire to balance safety, cost, and efficiency in favor of safety as a singular priority. So how did that look in reality? How did the managers of a system take responsibility for life and death when every user was a unique individual? What Sweden did was shift the seat of responsibility. They decided that the system manager was more responsible for safe outcomes than the individual users of the system. So when someone died or was injured on the road, the most powerful people in charge of the system were responsible for explaining how they had let it happen. Beginning that day, instead of designing for a perfect human, those officials began asking what might go wrong and building to reduce the harm of inevitable mistakes. And when things went wrong, it was not seen as an aberration, but as evidence of a system-wide failure. If someone died on a road with four lanes, every four-lane road was considered suspect. Safety was first, convenience and cost were sacrificed where necessary. In two decades, as traffic volumes grew, Sweden cut the number of people killed on the roads by half, all while traffic fatality rates climbed in the US. Today, the per capita rate of traffic fatalities in Sweden is less than a third of that in the US. And at the core of Sweden's success was a shift in how personal responsibility related to power. For the first time ever, the most powerful people, the people who designed the system and set the budgets and defined the goals, were accountable to the people who used the system. And this simple act, assigning accountability to the people with the most power, meant that preventing harm was no longer a personal responsibility. Rather, it was a responsibility that came with power. This is why I wanted you to hear this story, because even if Indianapolis is nothing like Sweden, power and leadership are a universal language. So what's the lesson here? The status quo only changes when powerful people use that power to change systems. Willingness to take up that power requires bucking tradition, require, retiring the dominant paradigm, and truly actually hoping for better. 
Klaus Tingvall could have insisted that every traffic crash in Sweden was an accident, and the only people with the power to stop harm on the road were individual drivers. Instead, he accepted responsibility for the system. He took up the power he already had and used it to acknowledge how changing the system was actually the only thing that could change outcomes. As we wrap up, I'd like to share with you a quote from Dr. William Hayden. Hayden was the first administrator of the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. He helped to usher in the first vehicle safety standards, like airbags and collapsible steering columns. So in the 1970s, a reporter asked Hayden why he was opposed to scolding drivers as an answer to the nation's safety problems. Here's how he replied. We've all been miseducated that the way to solve this problem is to have more squads of police chasing Americans so they wouldn't drive 120 miles an hour, rather than arranging cars so they can't go that fast. If a mother turns to look at her baby and she goes off the road and hits a pole that shouldn't have been there, that turns a mishap into a fatal event. I think that's too high a penalty for being human. This is your work. As managers and designers and bosses of the transportation system, it is your work to reduce the penalty for being human, to make mistakes survivable, to make errors less consequential, to build streets safe even for the sleepiest drivers, the most distracted pedestrians, and the least experienced cyclists. I want you to make your streets safe, even for drunks, and lower the penalty for being human. A safe system accepts that people are imperfect and plans for people to make mistakes. It's foolproof in the sense that it assumes people are fools and builds for them, so that foolishness and mistakes and bad decisions are not death sentences. A safe system turns away from the idea that people can be trained to behave safely at all times and towards the idea that the consequences of errors can be made less consequential. Instead of improving compliance, a safe system aims to design for mistakes and limitations. It can be easy in the business of government to feel like your work is fixing potholes, that all everyone wants you to do is fix the potholes, because that's the complaints you get, right? But that is only the public underestimating the potential of government. You can surprise them. You can show them that saving lives can be the bread and butter work-a-day politics of this government. You can make the elimination of everyday traffic violence as expected as patching potholes. As traffic injuries rise in your cities and towns, remember that some things are out of your control. You cannot make cars safer, that's federal policy. You cannot control the behavior of every citizen, that's impossible. But you can control the roads where injuries occur. And by controlling those roads, you can reduce the impact of things outside your control. You can reduce the impact of dangerous vehicles and the impact of dangerous behavior. You only need to prioritize and fund your belief in the worth of protecting people. Traffic deaths are not inevitable. This is not a driver problem any more than it's an Indianapolis problem. Now, let's talk about how we can see it here. Thank you very much. My name is Jesse Singer. I'm the author of a book called There Are No Accidents, and it was a delight to speak to you all today. Uh, let's do some questions. Thank you so much, Jesse. Um, so for this Q&A session, we are gonna be having two additional local professionals join us on stage. Um, I do have some questions that I've prepared in advance, but we'll also be taking questions from the audience. But first, let's introduce our panelists. Laura Slusher is a traffic safety professional with over 20 years of experience in traffic safety, traffic operations, and intelligent transportation systems. She worked for the North Carolina Department of Transportation and as a consultant in Seattle before joining the Indiana Local Technical Assistance Program, where she has run the Helpers Local Roadway Safety Program for the last 13 years. Please join me in welcoming Laura. And then our other panelist is Damon Richards. Damon Richards is a former business owner who was drawn to active transportation advocacy by his experience during a solo cross-country bike ride. He is the former executive director of Bike Indianapolis and currently works as the Safe Rides Routes to School program manager at Health by Design. Welcome, Damon. <laughs> all right, so the first question I have for you. Uh, not all communities have budgets to allow for large infrastructure improvements such as pedestrian bridges or multi-lane roundabouts. What can communities do to improve traffic safety on a smaller budget? I, I, have, two, I have two cheap things I always like to lead with. Um, signal retiming. 
which is free. Um, it's very unlikely that the signals in your community, the traffic signals, are timed to the speed limit. Probably timed above it. Or randomly, that happens too. Time your traffic signals to your speed limit and start to talk about lowering your speed limit in your legislature. Um, and then the other thing, also free, is leading pedestrian intervals. Uh, Retime your signals so that your walk signs go walk while cars still have a red light giving pedestrians a head start across the street, making them much more visible by the time drivers start to go. Those are my two cheeps. You got any cheeps? Okay, yeah. Um, that's funny, you started with the engineering stuff. <laughs> I, I wasn't going the engineering route. Um, I am really a big fan of communication and groups and coalitions and commissions and getting the different people who are working in their silos, the four E's and all the other E's that we've attached to them, the law enforcement, the hospitals, the educators, along with the planners and engineers, um, into some kind of regular meeting. I This happened in North Carolina when I was there. It started with incident management and then we started talking about all the other things safety related. And it gets those people who need to be in the same room in the same room. We do that whenever we have a stakeholder meeting like for local road safety plans. Um, I was looking up some examples. Also, I know DPW has it now um, with their fatal review commission. They're getting different people together to talk monthly, I think or regularly, every other month. Okay, yes, you can tell you about that. <clears throat> but I was looking at Wisconsin. They actually have it in their state legislature that every county has a traffic safety review commission. Um, that's free. I mean, it's time, but for most of people, it's you know part of our jobs. And that's something, in addition to, you know, you know, the some of the smaller demo projects and like what she was showing with the delineators and where you can do temporary projects and stuff like that, those are pretty low cost for the locals. But um, that's my top one. Well, I have nothing to add to that. I was just going to say paint is not real expensive and you can have a big impact just changing the way the road looks. So, I think I'd actually like to build on that comment, David because we have a audience submitted question that talks about tactical urbanism. What are the most bang for your buck forms of tactical urbanism, um, which are short term, scalable, easily um, experimentable type uh, interventions that you can do? So if you can build a little bit, what do you mean when you talk about paint, putting paint down? Well, I think if you're gonna try to have the biggest impact, you're gonna be painting in intersections. Uh, do things that create bump outs that, that force drivers to slow down as they make those turns and that'll be a big impact. And I'll add that yes, paint is not cheap. Well, it depends on who you talk to, but paint only lasts like a year or two anyway. So these are temporary projects. So people are like, oh, you put paint out, it's gonna be gone. Well, it's gonna be gone anyway. <laughs> Let me tell you about people who have to repaint all the time. We have to do that with our center lines and edge lines as well. Um, it's a good way to do a test to see if it works. Maybe the bump outs are not the best thing at that intersection for whatever reason. It's a way to test something relatively cheaply, get the community involved if it's a tactical urbanism project. And yeah, it's paint. I like, I like the bump outs too. I like the marked crosswalks. Again, more paint, um, <laughs> lots of paint. Um, now there are options to get funding for some of these projects and go beyond the paint, but um, I don't think that was the gist of the question. So we'll leave it at paint, um, bump outs, um, parking on the roads, narrowing the streets by parking, as long as you're leaving those sight triangles open. I like the idea of, so it's actually a law in Indiana, you can't park 20 feet within a crosswalk, but we mark it right, parking right up to the crosswalk. So, <laughs> um, things like that. We do that in New York City too. Oh, yeah. It's also the Must law. Must have learned from you. And it's, uh, <laughs> it's, yeah. All right. Oh, yes, question from the audience. We'll bring a microphone over to you. Thanks. Uh, so the, I have a, just building off of that question, the on East 10th Street, um, where they've done the tactical urbanism, they put up the Jersey barriers protecting the bike lane. And I, 
uh, like, would like to hear what you think of that, but that seems like the biggest bang for the buck that I've ever seen. I mean, it, you, you slow down in a car when you're driving next to those Jersey barriers. And if you're in a bike, you're, you're protected, you know, literally protected. It's not just some paint. It's not those plastic posts that are vertical paint. It's a, you know, a big barrier. So I, I don't know, what, what do you think about putting more of those up around town? I, I would personally love to see that. But I might have a, a different, I, I don't know the street, but I do know about some of, I, I was watching some of the, the more radical tactical urbanism projects that you have here and with such admiration, um, you know, folks, folks um, putting in their own Jersey barriers and putting in uh, not flexi posts, but buckets of cement with signs in them. <laughs> and I was just like, hell yeah, Indianapolis. <laughs> but, you know, um, I, I do come from a community that says paint is not protection. Um, and, you know, I want to be really straightforward. There were flexi posts bollards on the street where Eric was killed. Um, and the person who killed him drove over them. And then they reinstalled them the next day. Um, but so I think, you know, Jersey batteries are magic. First of all, because they're cheap, they're movable, and they make extremely clear, again, to imperfect drivers, what is going on. Like, a thing I think we don't understand in this country is that driving is really hard. Like, cognitively, it is difficult to be a person moving a car through space, through a city, with so many different signals firing, much less like a person who has a job and perhaps children screaming in the back seat and a life that is distracting them and a smartphone. So stuff like that, where we can make extremely clear that there is no doubt on who's protected, who goes on what side, and you know, physical barrier everything we can. Now, a, Jersey, a lot of times the Jersey barriers fill with water. What's gonna happen if a car hits them? It'll at least reduce the impact. It'll at least reduce the harm. I'm curious, you said Jersey barriers are cheap. Are you talking about the water-filled ones or the concrete, or do you I know? Okay. I have no idea how much a Jersey barrier costs. So. <laughs> well, more than paint. More than paint, yeah. More than paint, <laughs> but also it, it doesn't cost redesigning the street. Right. You know what I mean? Like, we can, we can limit how much involvement, like, an engineering team has. Are we going to review it? You know, we can, we can put down the protection on the line. So in yeah, that no, sense. I'm I'm a fan. I'm I'm more of a fan of the water-filled ones than the concrete. Um, just it it really we can't really put them everywhere. You don't want to put <clears throat> like for example, if you hit the concrete head-on, it's going to you know anybody a bike or well maybe not a pedestrian, but <laughs> maybe some of the faster runners. But um, they're designed to be hit a certain way. Um, whereas the water barriers, I think, would give more. I haven't actually studied that, so I can't offer technical advice on that, but I definitely see the value in creating more of a separation. So there's different steps that the local agencies can do. You know, yeah, paint is the lowest level and redesign is the highest level. And where you fit in between that depends on the agency and their funding um, and who wants it and how much they want to put some skin in the game as well. I'd say the biggest complaint of using Jersey barriers is they're ugly. Um, <laughs> and, and even the Tinstry project, they, they painted them, they hired an artist, and that's wonderful. And I love what they did there. And the impact is phenomenal in terms of traffic speeds have gone where they ought to be. Um, but they also got a lot of pushback from neighbors about how ugly they made their street look. So it all has to be balanced. And, and as a temporary project, it's great. And then what do you do when that temporary project is over becomes the real question. But they're great for demonstration projects. <laughs> All right, next question. So cities across the country are trying to eliminate fatal and serious crashes. What are some common roadblocks that are stopping cities from accomplishing this goal? So obviously we've talked you know, extensively about um, mindset, but are there any other items that you think are really in the way between cities implementing? Well, funding, obviously. Um, 
redesigning a road costs money. And, you know, if you live here in Indianapolis, you know the story of our road construction money. So that's probably more than anything else the problem here in this community is that we don't have the funding to be able to do these things. I'll also add um, the turnover for employees and maybe your safety champion, um, <laughs> engineers and planners jump ship a lot and go around. In addition, your elected officials, they may only be in office for a few years and the guy or gal coming in, the first thing they wanna do is you know, not do what the other person did. So how you can transcend that is through a local road safety plan or a safety action plan, whatever you want to call it, any type of long-term plan that has safety as part of it, even if it's a bike ped plan, the, that the community helped put together, the community wants, and then when you have the new elected official or new people come in, they have that plan and they're going to be following it or, you know, everybody's going to get on them because they help put that together. So that's one way. So I see it a lot in local agencies, just employee turnover um, and getting retraining all the new people <laughs> and getting them on board. Um, so yeah, funding and personnel. If I'm forced to add to that, I, I thought about, uh, you, you mentioned that the fact that drivers think the Jersey barriers are ugly. Uh, sorry, the local residents, and like I would call that like a political failure, a failure of elected officials um, and you know the the most powerful people behind these safety plans to explain what they're doing and why they're doing and why it benefits people who live on that street, whether they drive or walk or bike or have kids or older parents living with them. Um, like political failure and a messaging failure because all that they're reacting to is not that it's ugly, but that it's different, right? A row of parked cars is ugly, a street is ugly, none of it's a field of flowers. But, you know, I think there is a lack of ownership we get of like what we're actually doing here. Um, and that safety is something that affects every constituency. Um, it's something that you want. It's not a thing for people who ride bikes on the weekends in spandex. So traffic enforcement is a topic that's often fraught when it's brought up. Um, there's a lot of contention about its role in traffic safety, if it plays a role. Um, in your professional opinion, is there a way that we can use enforcement that relies less on punitive measures and interactions between road users and police? This is my favorite question. Uh, um, I mean, Number one is the sort of redesigns that we're talking about here. We can build streets that are self-enforcing. We can build streets that are self-educational. Um, as a stopgap on the way there, we need to use automated enforcement because it works 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. It doesn't miss. It sees every offense. Um, it's not biased. It's not racist. It's not fallible comparatively. Um, and I, there's something I like to bring up when I come to this is there are a lot of people who are against it because no one wants to get caught every time. Everyone wants the normal police enforcement where you just get caught every fifth time and then you feel like you had a bad week and maybe you'll be lucky next week. You know, we're all gamblers. Um, so something, but, but there's always this thing, oh, it's just a cash grab. And something I feel really strongly about is that when we implement automated enforcement systems, the money that that automated enforcement system makes should go directly to redesigning the road that is catching these speeders or these people violating the law. The money should go directly back to that. And the local planning department should face penalization if they do not see summons is reduced over a certain number of years. Because if you have a route that's catching 500 speeders on a road every, every day for three years, that's not an enforcement failure, that's a design failure. And so we should be putting that money back into redesigning those roads and requiring the municipalities to be accountable for ticket heavy streets because they know how to design it to make you slow down. Um, and then we'll see summons is declining over time and start to like fight those accusations of things being a cash grab. 
So we're we're talking to the choir here. Like I was telling somebody, we're you know we're talking in an echo chamber for the most part. But um, I do have to say, welcome to a red state. <laughs> <laughs> we do not have, we are getting slowly dipping a toe right at the edge, um, but it's not allowed by legislature at this time. Um, I will say, until we get to that point, I'm very much a fan of that as well. Um, I'm still waiting for all my tickets from my last trip um, west, so <laughs> hopefully I know. Um, I am one who works with law enforcement a lot. When I go to local agencies, a lot of time I'm meeting with their part-time sheriff who varies his schedule so he can, you know, hit all the things. And you talk about how engineers and all of us have lots of place in the air. I will tell you the local agencies do as well. Um, they're not even full-time. They don't have full-time staff. Um, so part of what, so one, they can't spend all their time enforcing. And we already talked about self-designing roads, self-enforcing roads. Um, big fan of that as well when it can happen or when we can get there, hopefully, eventually. I'm a big fan of education. Of, And I live in a college town. And the first time all the new students come in, we have a lot of international students, the, the uh, law enforcement is stopping everybody to educate them. This is where we ride bikes. This is where we don't ride scooters. This is how we do it. It's, it's more of an education piece. And there's real benefit to that. So that's more how we should be involving our police and enforcement um, and all law enforcement in the community for, for the better good. And every time we, like I said, I'm a big fan of um, groups and safety coalitions and regional plannings and stuff like that having the law enforcement in the room so they can bring up issues and you know everybody else can bring up issues and you sit down and have a conversation with them let them know a lot of times we do road safety audits we'll go out there and we'll go gosh speeding's really bad here you know what can we do yes we know it's a human issue yes we also know it's a road issue and they're like well we can't do enforcement here we physically can't enforce it so we have to you know, readjust our thinking. We can't rely on enforcement. We have to rely on education and all these, engineering, planning, everything. So I like to get the police involved, but in a different way. Well, I'm just going to echo what Jesse said. I think automated traffic enforcement and committing the money to road improvement would go a long way to create a safe environment and, and Every one of you should be talking to every one of your legislators, state and local, about making that happen. Um, one more, another opportunity. I just want to emphasize that we are taking questions from the audience. <laughs> oh, I see one. I think it's I think it's a pilot program, but they have introduced speed limiting on a few of their vehicles, and the New York Legislature is considering that too as a mandate for new vehicles. Do you view that as a solution that fixes a condition, or where does that fit within the enforcement? Yes, that fixes the condition. Yeah, um, that's that, that's what William Heaton was talking about. Why why did we have police officers enforcing? speed limits when we could just make cars. And notably, we've been able to make cars with speed limiters since like 1910. <laughs> Why can our cars go so fast? It's because it sells more cars. That's the reason. Yeah, speed limiters are great. This program in New York City is only a pilot on New York City's fleet, so vehicles that the city owns. But there's also a bill in the legislature that would put speed limiters on the vehicles of chronic speeders. So people who've been caught by our automated import enforcement cameras, I think like six or more times going 50 miles over or something like that. Um, and it does that thing. It does the safety science thing. It puts a barrier between harm and potentially dangerous energy and potentially fragile human bodies. It's perfect. <laughs> and if anybody's ever rented a U-Haul, you can only go 55. I mean, they have that block in there. It's been like that since I was in college. 
So I don't know if it's, you know, of course that was just like last week, right? But um, <laughs> you rent some of these big vehicles and they have like a block underneath. You can only go 55. And that's true of a lot of trucking that happens now because trucking companies want to reduce their incidents. So they have put these technologies on their vehicles. There's a great group called Together for Safer Roads that works with the trucking industry to try and uh, implement these safety advances wherever they can because it's valuable to companies to reduce these incidents, um, if only it were also valuable to automakers. All right, I have one. Oh, do we have a question in the back? Oh, could you comment just uh, briefly on what appears to be, at least in my eyes when I am on the roadways, a trend uh, towards uh, highly aggressive uh, driving, reckless, uh, reckless behavior out there just seemingly every every time I hit the road is that something is just it's just me or is that is that a trend I think that is unquantifiable we, we would never be able to measure you know aggressive driving behavior confirmation bias is a thing but I don't deny what you're seeing um, I think a way to understand it though is that conditions induce behavior. And maybe one of the conditions that's happening for people on the roads that you're driving is that they're more stressed about other things. The economy's bad, inflation's insane, housing, the housing situation is terrifying, right? Those things could also induce different driver behavior. Um, but none of those things are something that you or I can control. And that's why I come back to road design. And that's why I come back to changing the conditions on the road. Because sure, maybe people are driving like maniacs more than ever before. But the only way we're gonna solve it, the only practical solution to that that's in our control is changing the conditions on the road in a way that will induce different behavior. So I don't know the answer of whether it is a trend or not. I do know that the only solution is what we see when we actually change the conditions on the road. I'll add it's all the Illinois drivers. No, I'm serious. <laughs> if you've driven through Chicago and then all of a sudden you're on 65 and you can actually move, it's enlightening. It's like, oh yeah, <laughs> I'm going 80 or 90, right? It's just the frustration. But it is, like she said, the road also, all the construction projects, you know, the joke is, you know, our state flowers, the construction barrel or cone or whatever, which is partially true. Um, and people get so frustrated with that. We see that in our work zones when you have flaggers out there. We have to teach them how not to lose their cool because they get the brunt of everybody's, all their problems, and all of a sudden you've stopped them. And just us in society as a whole has gotten a lot meaner, I think. <laughs> um, so we're just seeing that manifested in the road, or we seem to see it. Um, I don't think anybody's studied it, but... As much as I drive 65 between here and Chicago, I can tell you it's definitely mostly Illinois drivers. <laughs> Even though we crash more. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I share your concern and, and I feel like I see it too. But it, again, it is, it's road design. We've, we've built roads that let them do that. Um, I don't know the solution. Build better roads. Um, vehicles have been getting bigger. Cars and truck or trucks and SUVs are the dominant types of vehicles that are being sold. How does that fit into what we're seeing? And also, when you're making these kind of roadways smaller, is how do you pair that with bigger vehicles? My hope is that as we make smaller roads, the vehicles will get smaller. <laughs> uh, because we, we have those big vehicles because we have big roads. People are, are buying vehicles that don't fit in their garage. And they're not going off-road and they're not hauling a horse trailer. They're bopping to the grocery store in these monster vehicles. And this is an EV problem, too, because those vehicles weigh more. And so... You put that speed behind that heavy vehicle and you're causing more damage. Um, but I, I, I personally believe that too is a road design problem. If we have smaller roads, people, aren't, people will feel less comfortable driving those large vehicles. 
I'll add, as somebody who does a lot of work in rural areas, that we do need big vehicles. We have big combines, um, and you should see what they do to our roads. And if you've ever had to pass a combine in a curve at night, which I have, it's very scary. So yeah, in urban areas, I just, I don't, I'm very much cognizant of the fact that yes, bigger vehicles have greater kinetic energy, greater force, and they're, I mean, we have big vehicles for our um, office, and we downsize just because we know we have to go to Indy a lot, and we have to fit in the parking garages, so we're not going to have the big vehicles. I drive a big vehicle just because I tow a camper. Um, so I have a legit excuse, but I do take it to the grocery store. I apologize. <laughs> um, but there are spaces for big vehicles, and there it's part of our culture. You know, especially, you know, go down to Texas. You know, everything's bigger down there, right? I'm not... Um, um, justifying, you know, everybody should get big vehicles, but there is, there is a place for them. Um, and yeah, no, it doesn't have to be a huge, I don't even know how much they weigh now. You know, it could just be your regular old pickup truck. But there is a place for them, and it's usually not in our downtown urban areas. Um, although, you know, those people need to go, you know, maybe they want to come to this meeting too. So um, there is a place for them, but there's also a place for the smaller cars as well. And I think we can all get along. <laughs> um, and I hope that there's a lot that needs to be done with vehicles. And uh, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> I think there's probably an important distinction here to make between trucks and SUVs as things that exist versus the vehicle bloat that we've seen in the past 10 years. The average size and weight of our vehicles has grown massively, while at the same time, automakers are selling, offering fewer sedans more trucks and SUVs. So they've made the footprint much larger. Now, the truck, the Ford Ranger that they were making 10, 15 years ago is perfectly capable of doing all of the hauling. You know, we're not necessarily talking about a power issue. And if we are talking about a power issue, someone who needs to move something massive, then they should get a CDL, a commercial driver's license, um, and the training to move that sort of vehicle. But I didn't want to bring up vehicle bloat because I wanted to talk to you about problems you can solve. And you can't make Pete Buttigieg get a spine and start to regulate the auto industry. Um, it's a fight that the Biden administration doesn't want to get into. Um, that's become very clear. The evidence is crystal clear that the rise in pedestrian and cyclist fatalities is directly attributable to the rising size and weight and mode shift, uh, mode share of SUVs and trucks. But until NHTSA, which Dr. William Hayden, the guy who said we shouldn't make cars that can go 120 miles an hour, he, he was the first administrator of NHTSA, and look at where we are today. Um, they won't pass any vehicle regulations, much less ones that are going to limit the size of vehicles. So we're essentially in a position where we need to do it locally. Um, we've got a bill in the works in New York City, one's already passed in D.C. that starts to add a tax on the heaviest vehicles. So if you want to have a giant vehicle, that's fine. You're going to pay for your road wear. You're going to pay for your increased pollution. And you're going to pay for the harm you're going to cause. Um, you know, that's a great way to start to move things forward in the right direction without the federal regulation that seems to not want to catch up. Um, but it's a real problem. I appreciate you bringing it up. And just uh, one little thing to add, it's not just the weight and the size, it's that A-pillar. When you look at some skewed intersections, everybody who's shaking their head has gone out and looked at these, you know, dangerous intersections, if you will, and you have that huge A-pillar right at the front. If you guys don't know what it is, it's ABC pillar when you go back on your car, and you've got to do one of these things. I have to do that when I'm driving through the parking lot, like at the grocery store. I'm like really paranoid about it. So it's not just the size and the weight, it's also the design as well. But they're helping in some ways. I, I don't disagree at anything with what you said. Um, we've advanced a lot in um, airbags, like side curtain airbags, like all the way around newer vehicles, um, is helping to reduce injuries and potentially fatalities. So there have been some improvements that we'll recognize the auto industry for, um, but there's still a long way to go. That's actually an interesting point, right? Like people inside the biggest vehicles are safer than ever before, except, and this is a really tricky thing. So you're all, you know, you're all like, yeah, but what about the pedestrians and cyclists? Definitely more at risk than ever before. But something we don't talk about enough is the fact that low income people, people in old cars, people driving smaller vehicles are more at risk than ever before. So we're seeing this increase in driver and passenger fatalities when the 
two cars crash and one of the cars is older and smaller and therefore much more likely to be driven by a person who doesn't have a lot of money. Um, so we're seeing this real economic calculus of what's happening on our roads where there's just a divide of have and have nots and it means life or death. All right, I have one closing question for you all. Um, what is something, is there something in US regulatory policy that gives you hope for positive change? <laughs> That's why I preface with, is there? <laughs> um, I am encouraged by the increase in safety funding. Unfortunately, it's tied to the increases in fatality, so I'm not happy how we got here, but I'm happy there is increases in funding. There's more programs out there. Everyone is much more aware, you know, what tactical urbanism even is. You know, we didn't have to really define it for anybody in the room. Um, so I'm, I'm glad the knowledge level, especially in some of the community advocacy groups, is risen. Um, funding is at an all-time high because of, you know, what we won't talk about. <laughs> because of the problems is, is the reason why. But that gives me hope that we are doing better than we were, say, 10 years ago. I was going to say, I, no. Uh, I mean, e even though we're spending more than ever before, it's a tiny, tiny fraction of the transportation budget. I mean, if, if we spent a more proportionate amount of our federal dollars on active transportation, as opposed to building bigger and wider roads, we could solve this problem pretty fast. But we have an elected people who will do that. That was such a nice closer. I feel bad bringing up my very specific answer. But um, one thing that the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration recently introduced is the beginnings of regulation, the regulatory process for automatic emergency pedestrian detection braking in every vehicle, as well as driver automated driver alcohol detection systems. So it's technology that can tell if the driver's drunk, and it's technology that can tell there's a pedestrian in front of the car. Neither technology is perfect, but it is a beginning of showing that the person outside the car matters and can be protected by the regulatory environment. Um, it's like a first baby step, um, but it's an acknowledgement of what everyone in this room is working towards, you know, and what we've all been working towards by building bike lanes and daylighting our intersections um, from the federal government that, you know, that this is a universal problem, that people might be in front of your car and you might need help seeing them and stopping. So there's a little bit of hope there. Um, and also, as someone who travels the country, this room gives me hope. Y'all give me hope, you know? Um, it's really nice to see all these people in the room who care and who get it and who are trying to do the work. Um, so I, you know, if, if it's federal, you know, if, it, if I add up all my trips around the country into rooms like this. So, uh, um, you know, I certainly see hope in that. And that's a wonderful closer. Thank you so much to our panel.